I'm very happy to see new faces. I'm very happy to see Pro Helvetia faces here too, and Foundation Salzburg too. Um, we are very happy to have Ranjana in um, doing our residence program. And I won't say much because Ranjana will say everything. I just want to, um, to say hello, to introduce Ranjana, and to tell you that yeah, what is what is he presenting today, Ranjana? Won a stipendium, a grant from Pro Helvetia to um, is the, um, called um, research trips. So she is still working on this project that she is presenting today. So probably for her it would be also important that you tell them after what you think. And um, she won only talk. She would. She will like you to be part of her performance too, but she will tell you that. Uh, and um, her research deals with the relationship uh, between spoken language and dance. Um, and I just let you in these hands from Jana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so yes, I am going to make you um, participate. Not make you participate. You can choose to participate if you'd like to. When uh, can you, I can actually stand up so that everyone can see me. When I was writing a summary to invite people to this presentation, um, Merle told me again and again that I was being too abstract uh, about what the topic of this presentation was. And she kept saying, you know, so abstract, no one's going to come. And, uh, and yeah, but you're here. And we haven't locked the doors yet. But you're here. <laughs> so that's great. Let's begin. So as she said, I'm looking at how language shapes the body in performance. Um, I started out by wanting to consider the relationship between spoken language and dance, um, thinking of transfers of meaning between words and movement as practices of translation. Um, that changed as I started grappling with why we need to talk about practices of translation. Um, and added to this grappling were also my own existential doubts about the role of language. Uh, my imagination of language is rooted in what the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu calls the habitus, um, which he describes as the learned set of preferences or dispositions that allow a person to orient to the social world. So what a person likes, how they present themselves, um, and also how they make meaning of things. To speak of language then is to speak of identity, um, of how we belong to specific places, times, communities, and also ideas. Um, in my research, translation is a dynamic concept. Um, it's where meaning happens. Uh, so it's both a site and a process in some ways. Uh, it's where codes become actions. Uh, where an idea is fermented into another form. And all of these things also happen between mediums and modes of trans, uh, transmission, uh, bouncing between performance, popular culture, daily life, uh, and also works of cultural theory that have been dealing through this period. Um, and the reason I'm interested in translation, translation as a site, translation as a process, uh, is because it allows us to consider the question of identity. To identify with something or someone is to perform belonging. How do we create systems of belonging and how do we perform belonging? Uh, that's something I've begun to look at a lot in my work. The author, Jhumpa Lahiri, um, writing about her experience of learning Italian as an adult, and writing and translating in Italian, um, throws this question of belonging back at language. Uh, she asks, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing her here, she says, uh, what does it mean to belong to a language? And to that I, I want to add, if you can belong to language, can you also be trapped by it? Um, we often hear aphorisms like, 
words are not enough. You know, you see a performance and then you come out and you say, oh, words aren't enough to describe what just happened. Uh, and statements like that reflect the frustration of being limited by language or the inadequacy of language. Um, this, this weekend, we had a gathering in the forest and uh, I was speaking to a Mexican man uh, who told me how he didn't care for salsa and bachata and all these other partner dances that he'd grown up with um, because they were regulated by very predetermined ways of doing things. Um, and compared to that, the independent dance scene in Europe was a huge revelation for him uh, because suddenly dance did not need to be tied to a codified movement vocabulary. So this allowed for him, uh, this allowed each performance to um, be a window into a new system of meaning, uh, independent of the other systems that came before or after it. Unlike language, where meanings take much longer to be made and unmade. Um, in, its, um, in its fixity, one of the other things we discussed was how language sometimes turns on itself. We were talking about the dictionary and how long it takes for things to enter a dictionary. People might be using words for years and years and years, and it's only after they, you know, they, they spend a long time in society that they actually enter the dictionary. Before that, they're on the fringes of life, like, you know, they're special words, they're words you see in italics, but they take a long time to enter this canon. The other, um, my other resentment with language in the past 45 days has been that language can sometimes seem like it's occluded by reason, it's obstructed by reason. It's a medium in which things are expected to make sense, uh, to be understood. Um, we presuppose rationality when we turn to language, even if like, we're, we're looking at prose, poetry, or gibberish, whatever it is, we assume that we will understand or not understand what we're looking at. Um, as James Baldwin puts it, um, the role of language is to control the universe by describing it. Um, I, I will come back to this sentence and to why he says it later. Uh, when I read this, I felt like it channeled my feelings of resentment quite very beautifully. Um, as a writer in residence, I am expected to write. What happens when I have no words? Uh, not because words aren't enough, but because the words don't, you know, they're not arriving in place when I want them to. Uh, they're floating in word documents, in notepads and journals, uh, even on toilet paper, like I scribble questions on toilet paper in the hope that looking at them will, you know, make me uh, arrive at a realization I don't have yet. But all these words in all these different places um, don't always organize themselves in orderings that make sense to me, uh, let alone other people. So even as I fight reason, I'm also preoccupied by making sense, uh, which is a conflict I haven't quite resolved. So, so my work has then been, I've been concerned with what I'm writing, but also more about how I'm doing that. Um, and that's why performance offered a very different relationship to language um, and to its accompanying burdens of logic and reason. So drawing from performance today, I am building a choreographic score in the course of my presentation. Uh, that's where the score is. And, and what the score also allows me to do is uh, I'm working with ideas and questions that are still unfinished and not quite there yet, and the score allows me to accommodate them in their incompleteness. Before we dive right into it, um, I wanted to spend a minute talking about what a score is. Um, as we sent out the announcements for this event, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to find an adequate German translation for score. Um, all the dramaturgs I spoke to uh, sniggered at the term dance notation. Uh, it was almost as if, you know, it was a codified snigger, as if all of them had decided collectively that this is what their response to that term is. Uh, and one of them told me why. Um, a notation is a written record 
it's an established document. It tells you what to do, how to proceed, how to plead, how to perform. It's, it's there and it's absolute in its materiality, uh, almost as if you can't mess with it. A score is a gentler view. It's a suggestion of what can happen, but it can also change as it is interpreted uh, based on how things happen. So it suggests specific actions, but it can also be whatever you want it to be. It can be a series of movement prompts, it can be a bunch of action statements, or even a manifesto. So today the score, uh, a very short score, allows me to be non-linear. It allows me to hop between references, between times, places, and meanings. Um, and in investigating how belonging might be performed, it also plays with translation as a way of improvising, uh, where meanings can be stretched and remade into other meanings. Uh, one question I'm interested in today is, how flexible can a translation be? That's something I'm hoping to look at through this score. I think I should just skip this when I ask you to the oh, yeah, it. I can do it. Okay, this is the first one. Uh, yeah, so read it. Yeah, <laughs> so this is what you have to do. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, um, I'm, I'm still figuring this out, but uh, I'd love for you to try it out chart as well if you feel comfortable doing that. The instructions are all here. There's even a really bad uh, line <laughs> right up, right? So okay, I can try. Okay. Yeah, just you, uh, you can actually just stay wherever you are and... Ah, okay, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do it sitting. Doesn't Absolutely. You can do it sitting, standing, however you want to do it. So I've had lots of feedback on how to do this in the past few days. Um, you know, I've had people <laughs> telling me that I should have one arm higher than the other uh, to show the power I hold over the person or people I'm directing this gesture to. Um, someone else told me that I should tilt my head to make this more beautiful. <laughs> Not sure how that comes with this, but yeah. Uh, when I first started trying it out, I, uh, I would open my chest out to the sky because that's how I imagined it. I imagined it as, as this sort of expansive gesture in this mountain landscape, so I'd be doing that. Uh, but a third person told me that this was my memory receiving me because uh, the body, wherever it was, needed to make space for other bodies to be held by it. So it couldn't be out there, but really needed to hold other bodies. And yeah, I needed to make space for these other bodies. How do you locate the gesture? Um, is it rooted to a body? Um, is it rooted to a place, an image? This gesture that we just tried out is from a song and dance sequence sh shot in Switzerland uh, nearly three decades ago uh, for a cult Bollywood film called Dilwale Dodanya Le Jayenge, the, which, which, the, which is officially translated as the brave hearted will take the bride. <laughs> Uh, even today, tourists go and visit the locations this was filmed at with all the intensity of a pilgrimage. There are these YouTube videos where people, you know, people are going really seriously from one cafe in Kastar to another and saying, oh, we're standing here now, we're standing here now. And, and it's actually really quite moving to watch that, to watch the intensity with which they do that. This gesture uh, would take on a life and significance beyond the film becoming the signature step of Shah Rukh Khan, the actor who performed it. Um, decades later, it's still part of his myth. 
Um, when he says, when he appears at the gates of his mansion in Bombay to say hello to his fans, that's the gesture he performs. And his fans respond in kind with, yeah, sort of the same gesture. How banal the gesture may actually be never really matters. Uh, in, I found an award show video where uh, this at the actor Shah Rukh Khan um, coaches the audience to, through this gesture, and um, and actually that's a, so that's a score I should attribute to Shah Rukh Khan because he said those words, um, and he tells us why that works for him. He says. You know, he says, I struggle to dance, and this is a step that allows you to get away with everything in Bollywood, and then he performs it. Um, and seeing his peers and fans cheer him on, um, you begin to realize how, how the ordinariness of this gesture doesn't matter, because it's a part of his myth. Um, even when I do it, I'm channeling him doing it. Um, it's really a great example of what the feminist theorist Karen Barrett calls agential realism, where, where two things come into being only because of their interaction with each other, what uh, uh, Barrett calls interaction. So the gesture and the body exist independently, but, but they only make sense when you see it in this embodiment. And, and that's, why, that's why it means what it means. That was movement one of the score. Let's go to the next one. Do you all have your phones on you? I'm assuming you do. Okay, get them out. And take a selfie. <laughs>
happens when the production and reception of an image are simultaneous. Um, this, these are stills from a piece I watched recently called Notebook uh, by the choreographer and visual artist Alexander Vatsetsis. Um, the synopsis describes this piece as a profound and lustful exploration of her personal biography. And the reason that sort of caught my ear is because we are used to encountering biographies as books or as films, uh, but how do you turn your life into a score? Um, and the artist in dialogue with a range of partners begins to channel her encounters with them you know, through her own body. Uh, there's a live camera feed on stage, so there's which the uh, which the dancers set up themselves. Uh, so, so as the audience, we're seeing two different frames. We're seeing uh, the body striking poses for the camera, um, and we're also seeing, you know, the dancers actually do the work of getting into these poses, um, which is which is a lot of work. If you uh, looking at this, I was also reminded of uh, of those Instagram pages that catalog how hard it is to actually, you know, shoot an influencer style photo and how much how much you need to do. So the, the minutes people spend standing, for instance, with like, you know, one leg up to get a photo. So, so it's a lot of work. The body here is produced and received simultaneously in different ways. Uh, and, and what interests me is that these poses hold meaning. We've seen these poses. We've seen them on billboards. We've seen on social media, but but they hold meaning only because of the loop of translation, because you're seeing the body producing these poses and you're seeing how you receive them. And, and somewhere it made me feel like the choreographic score itself was that loop then, and uh, the loop of production and reception that the dancers stage for us, but which the dancers don't, don't quite see in the same way because they're in front of the camera, not behind it. So the next time you take a selfie, uh, focus on what else is in the frame. When you leave the room, if you yeah, if you have to talk about this to someone, how many different ways could you talk about it in? Think about that. We notionally have the freedom to perform our belonging, to imagine communities. But who decides how we belong? Uh, what concepts, records, documents, notations? Do they consult to pronounce judgment on belonging? Sorry. 
how can these existing materials, all these records and notations, be, we talked about stretching earlier, how can these existing materials be elasticized to accommodate new narratives? Uh, I was struck by these questions while watching a theater piece recently uh, called The Making of Pinocchio by the Glasgow-based artist uh, Rosanna Cade and Ivor McCaskill at a festival in Bern. <laughs> uh, the premise of that play is that they're making a play around the story of Pinocchio uh, while negotiating their own gender identity. And over five years of working on this play, the artists in real life, they're also a couple in real life, the artists start out as a lesbian couple. Uh, and then one of them comes out as trans, uh, socially transitioning and having top surgery to find himself in the body he wants to live in. Uh, and the other begins to identify as non-binary. So, so we are hearing them talk about their personal life <coughs> within the fabric of a very old and very well-known story, the story of Pinocchio. Um, Pinocchio is a wooden puppet who, just like the actor playing him, uh, wants to be a real boy. And, and what was fascinating was that the play didn't change the story of Pinocchio. You were, you were hearing exactly the same story you remember from the book. But it was almost as if it stretched, yeah, almost as if it stretched the story in different places, allowing it to see, allowing you to see it in a new way. Just a second. <coughs> childhood story of a naughty puppet who gets in all kinds of trouble was now the perfect parable for gender identity. How does the same story get translated at different points by different people for it to mean different things? How flexible can a translation be? This uh, this question also interests me because of the real life debates on same sex marriage in India, uh, with the Supreme Court hearing petitions for and against same sex marriage just last month. Um, the hearing started in my first week in Winterthur, and, and it was really surreal waking up here and tuning into the broadcast from courtroom one of the Supreme Court back in Delhi. Um, the Indian government's position through these hearings. Uh, has been based on the absoluteness of gender as a biological concept and, and on the absoluteness of family as a gendered concept of, as the family is a unit that has a man, a woman and their children. It fears that undoing them will require a lot of work and create a lot of confusion. So, um, I mean, there, there were moments in this, in this hearing that I want to recount. This is one of them. Um, talking about the rights and responsibilities that men and women had in uh, heterosexual marriages um, and how hard it would be to you know, reframe these uh, for the multiple gender and sexual identities that the petitioners represented. Um, the lawyer speaking for the government at one point raised his voice and said, um, <clears throat> My lord, who will be the man? Who will be the woman? It was really, uh, you know, these questions have played in my head, head like a soundtrack to a meme. Like, who will be the man? Who will be the woman? Who will be the man? Who will be the woman? Like, it's really played out like that. He went on to say, and here my arms are very important, biological man, my lord, means man only. <laughs> biological man means genitals, my lord. I didn't want to use that expression. That's also what he said. I'm not saying it. So then the judge tells him, um, you know, that's the point of view. Um, and because this is a Zoom feed, as you can see, we're also hearing reactions in real time. Someone's left their mic unmuted or something is happening and then we're hearing someone go, what is he saying? <laughs> if I'm a biological, if I'm not a biological man, does that mean I have no rights? What is he saying? Um, so yeah, the arguments go on and on in the same loop, and um, and they're really like they're really fascinating. 
like you could cancel your Netflix subscription and watch the Supreme Court's <laughs> Supreme Court hearings. Yeah. So there is a concept. The concept is inviolable, and even if it can be undone, it takes a lot of work to undo it. So the concept remains. Uh, though it thoroughly fails to account for the people it claims as its own. Let's come back to that line uh, by James Baldwin, uh, which he writes uh, in Switzerland. He's, uh, he's, a, as a, he's a black man in a very remote village in Switzerland, uh, where people haven't seen someone like him uh, before. And, and talking about that experience, he says, the role of language is to control the universe by describing it. What happens when we grow out of particular arrangements of language? Um, how do we find new ways of arranging the same ideas, of cutting up language and patching it back up differently? A few months before these hearings, um, a key figure from the uh, religious far right in India gave an interview uh, where he was asked about his views on queer rights and whether he thought homosexuality was an Indian concept. He responded with a mythological story uh, talking about two generals in a king's army. From an, uh, it, it's a story from an epic. Um, when one of them hears a rumor about the other dying, um, the first general also kills himself and chooses to die by suicide. So according to this person being interviewed, they suggested that the two were lovers. And, um, and in reading queerness into an old myth, um, you know, there, was a, there, there is a story that already exists and suddenly you, you point to a certain aspect of that story as you know, as the presence of queerness. And suddenly it belongs to a familiar mythology, a mythology you've studied, a mythology that is mixed with religion, with how you pray, with how you worship, what you believe in. If there were, uh, his argument of course, was that if there were queer people in those stories, then it was natural for people to be queer even today. And what, what was the big fuss about it? Did we really need to go to court, you know, people, he said something to the effect of people who were living quietly all this while, and you know, we can continue living quietly. There's no need to make a fuss. Um, what I'm interested in is the device of historical revisionism that he uses to read an old story differently, uh, to plant the concept in the past. Um, historical revisionism is used to sinister ends. We're seeing it being used in politics, religion, and society. Um, and, and maybe I'm beginning to feel, and I, I think that the making of Pinocchio also does that in some ways, that if we have to live with it, maybe we also begin to co-opt it and subvert it to our own ends. So I want to end with this. To make new concepts, we need to break old ones. Maybe the trick is to force the notation to be a score. Um, a concept may seem inviolable, but the narrative that it allows isn't. So infiltrating the narrative to belong to the story, then is perhaps where the translation begins. Thank you. I would love to hear from everyone, but it doesn't have to be now. We can even shake things up and, yeah. Let's 
Uh, it's apparently so common that the, the sort of tourist information centers now keep like flyers with a list of locations and with information on what location, like what scene was shot at what location. So you can just go to the tourist information center, pick up a printout and walk around Gistad or uh, yeah, and visit all these locations. <laughs> Also think uh, the producer's statue has yeah, been yeah. In, in Interlaken. In Interlaken. Yeah. You know, yes. yeah. Square, yeah. Right. You know, so I think it has immensely quite well. we're talking yeah. of now what one point five billion of us, right? And a small little country called Zutunia. It has really contributed to the tourism. It has uh, purely yes. this movie, right? I was in I was uh, I, I completed a hike that ended at Interlaken a couple of weeks ago and it, it, right now it's like full of uh, Indian tourists, there are Indian yeah. restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I was actually reading something like very interesting, how Interlaken, May and June is apparently when the Indian tourists come. Uh, starting in July, they have Arab tourists, so then the restaurants sort of change to serving Arab food and catering to Arab tourists. <laughs> so, <Exactly>. so yeah. <laughs> And this is, of course, this is not the only, the, not the only film shot in Switzerland. So, uh, starting in the 90s, um, uh, lots of like, 60s. Uh, actually, Sangam, uh, a film made in 1964, I think, was the first Indian film shot here, the first documented one. Um, but yeah, since like in the since the 90s, almost everything, Chandni was shot here and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I even found sort of someone I was working with in like uh, you know in the frame of a Telugu film shot in Lucerne. So this was Selena. She was <laughs> in the yeah. She told me that she'd been an extra in a Telu in a film, and then we looked the film up and we found her on the edge of the frame. Where everyone was wearing a sari and uh, yeah, randomly like a bunch like bunch of people wearing saris. Like next to the lake in that zone. <laughs> if you have any more questions, we can also we can also talk outside. Or for those of you who are staying for dinner, we can talk over dinner as well. Yes, yeah. as of um, for the ones that register for having dinner with the artists, we will start at seven in the garden. Um, otherwise, you can just stay, talk to Vajana, or yeah. you are welcome to come again. Thank you very much, Vajana. Thank you. Thank you.